this great God, the transcendent, infinite, eternal one that we worship, has continually reminded the human, human family that there are two ways. He instructed Adam and Eve this way in the Garden of Eden. He instructed the children of Israel this way as they stood on the brink of the Jordan, ready to enter into the land of promise. Later on, years later, hundreds of years later, Jeremiah again re-echoed this refrain. And I'm going to quote to you in brief from Deuteronomy chapter 30, where God says it this way. Behold, I have set before you life and death. Therefore, choose life. That's what God wants from us. He wants us to choose life. He has always wanted us to choose life. And he has provided the perfect remedy in the Lord Jesus Christ so that you and I, old and young alike, no matter where we come from, no, what, no matter what our cultural diversity might be, all of us may have life. We're here tonight because we want to embrace life. We want to embrace the living Lord Jesus and his kingdom. We want to embrace the ways of God and we want to live those in 2021 for the glory of God. We are, we encounter as we, as the human family makes the journey. We encounter a diverse uh, set of circumstances and and we're living in this time, in this day, and so we're wanting to address in this panel discussion tonight some of the issues that you and I face in this world in 2021. So we have a panel discussion. Brother Joe Kurtz will be leading this panel, and uh, Brother Joe, you and your panel may come forward, and we'll look forward to being ministered to by you. Let's pray. Gracious God, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity that lies just immediately ahead of us. We thank you, Father, for the, for the blessing that we anticipate you to pour out upon this assembled throng tonight through the efforts, the inspirations, the instruction of this panel. Would you bless them, each one, if there's anxiety in their hearts, I pray, Heavenly Father, you would work a mighty calming effect there. If there's uncertainty there, I pray, Heavenly Father, that you would give them clear direction. I pray, Heavenly Father, for Brother Joe as he moderates, that you would give him wisdom and discernment, and that each of us, as we participate, as we listen, as we receive, might receive with discernment that which is spoken to us. So use these dear brothers tonight, Heavenly Father, for your glory, work mightily through them, with them, with this people, and may the Lord Jesus and his kingdom be furthered and exalted tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, Brother Joe. Thank you for that prayer, Brother Kurt. Good evening. To um, everyone, welcome to this uh, panel discussion that uh, we're talking about tonight, the overarching topic, that title that was given to the talk is Spreading Life in a Culture of Death. My name is Joe Kurtz, and I'm here with my wife, Doreen, and six children. We're from Granby, Massachusetts, and I'll be moderating the uh the panel discussion here um, tonight. It's our hope that what we share here is not just is not just ideas or, but rather something that that can inspire us to to action and can inspire us to have to have more more compassion. I think what I'll do at, at this time is. introduce the, uh, the panelists. And before, before I do that, I just want to mention that the, you can go to the website even now 
while we are having this discussion, and you can submit questions there during this time. We, we need a couple of you to do that. It'd be a blessing if we had a few more questions come in, and those will be, those will be sent to us. So each of, the, each of the panelists, first of all, I'll tell you about the structure, and then, and then I'll introduce the panelists. So first of all, each of them will come up here to the podium, and they will present the remarks that they have prepared to, to share with you, and I'll be giving them about, about seven minutes to, to do that. And if they're, if they're nervous, it's because they're not sure how, how, the, how they're going to do that. I was telling Tim before, uh, earlier this afternoon, that if I knew a little bit about how they make condensed milk, that maybe I'd know how, how we can do this panel discussion, how I could get all of this condensed into a tin can. So they'll present for seven minutes, and then he will sit down. And for the next seven minutes, we are going to interact with each other. So it's like we're sitting in the living room, asking each other questions, and you're all welcome to listen. And we'll, we'll go through that four times. There's four, there's four topics and four men. We'll go through that four times, and then we'll transition to the last segment of our, of our time, and then we'll be, I'll be directing questions to them that have come in from you. So thank you for those that have already presented questions. Again, go to the website, kingdomfellowshipweekend.org. Uh, go to the 2021 event. You can scroll down to this evening's event. And there should be a link there. Click on that hyperlink, and you can, you can, submit, a, um, you can submit a question to... If we have time and it applies, we may attempt to answer it. And with that, the first topic is helping the homeless. Uh, we have Patrick Matthews here. He's all the way over on the left. And Patrick is from Chambersburg. He is gifted with many ideas and, and much passion for getting things started. He has lots of ideas of what he would love to see done for the kingdom of God yet, and um, he is, I would say that from what I've seen, he is making the, the best use of the time that, that God has, um, that, that he has. Recently, I was driving in the car with him, and he says, you know, Joe, I wish I had started on this life a long time ago. And well, he is, I think, doing a good job. At, uh, welcome, Patrick. We're glad that, that you're here to join us. And... He also has a passion for seeing things restored, whether it's old buildings or worn furniture that needs new upholstery or broken lives that are in need of restoration and, and wholeness. His love for beauty and his attempt to seize the moment is often expressed through his skill in photography, which is a favorite hobby. His burden for this talk, helping the homeless, is born out of his own experience living in a car, and time spent behind bars. You didn't know I was going to say that, did you? The next topic is Mark Yoder. Mark is seated over here. Mark has spoken a few times already. He is from Costa Rica. He was born in the Shenandoah, just real, real quick here. He was born in the Shenandoah Valley in Virginia when he was 11 years old. When he was a boy, they moved to Costa Rica, where he still lives. 53 years later, and his wife, Ruthanna, of 36 years, him and his wife, Ruthanna, currently live in uh, Chachagua, Costa Rica, where he serves as pastor. They have five children and three, three grandchildren. Mark's time is divided between pastoral duties and also the publishing house, where he does reviewing, writing, and illustrating. They publish a bi-monthly paper, some of you may be familiar with this one. I won't try the Spanish, but the English version is The Torch of Truth. And a favorite, a favorite hobby of Mark, Mark's is birding, watching birds and taking pictures of them and collecting all, all different 
kinds of pictures of, of birds. And his burden for this topic, loving the fatherless, arises out of his years of experience working with those who struggle due to a lack of a father. Next, we have Wolfgang Migiani, welcome, exposing unethical vaccines. He's a small town emergency room doctor in Ohio. He lives in Holmes County, Ohio with his wife, Lori. They have been married for 27 years and have eight children, one of whom is with the Lord, and also they have a grandchild. Wolf was raised Catholic, and Lori, his wife, was raised Lutheran. They have been among the playing communities now for about 29 years. Dr. Migiani has been writing and speaking for some years already about tainted vaccines. If you would like to read more of what he has written, you can go to, I'll say this twice, anabaptistmedicalmatters.blogspot.com. Anabaptist medicalmatters.blogspot.com. Someday, when the practice slows down, Wolf hopes to refine his hobby of rebinding classical Christian books and, and Bibles. Next, we have Tim Kipfer. Welcome, Tim. He's going to be speaking here on fighting addictions. Two years ago, he moved from Virginia to Boston, where he is currently studying at Sattler College. Him and his wife, Gina, have three children, age five, and under. Favorite pastimes for Tim and his family are exploring the coast, doing hikes, and enjoying downtown Boston. What's ahead for Tim and his family? In the next two years, they are planning to move to India along with a couple other families in a mission effort. I'm sure they'd appreciate prayer. Tim's burden for this topic, fighting addictions, comes from his own struggles as well as his experiences helping others, realizing that many others struggle with sexual addictions. So with that, Patrick, would you come up and you can share your remarks. I'm going to take a selfie, the largest KFC selfie as we can do, if I can get it to go. Now everybody say cheeseburger. <laughs> okay, I know that's kind of hokey, but that's, that's just how it goes. My name is Patrick Matthews. That was a first here at KFW. Um, sorry. I'm really nervous. I'm not used to doing things like this. I know how to break things. I don't know how to talk to people without a sledgehammer. And unfortunately, I don't have a sledgehammer. I have a couple other things. <laughs> anyway, give you a little indication where I came from. I came here nine years ago, and I created a stir. Jason Funk and Abner Zook took me and baptized me out back in the creek. This was the first year that KFW was here, and it caused a bit of a ripple. So if that's any indication of how I do things, I, I basically do things that are out of the box a bit. Okay, I work, I have a um, halfway house for sex offenders in Chambersburg. I am a sex offender. I did something that I shouldn't have done. I went to prison and my life changed. Before that, I collected debt for motorcycle clubs and I was a horrible individual. Like I said, I had a sledgehammer. I know how to break things. I don't know how to fix things. Um, the job that I have, I can tear things off quicker than they can put them together. So they hired me and they pay me really well. Um, I like breaking things. Okay. <clears throat> That was my form of trying to get rid of this. Um, I came out of prison and I started a ministry called Harkin House Ministry. I want to give a shout out to Chambersburg Christian Fellowship because I came out of the streets and I walked into a group of conservative Mennonites that were trying to acclimate to a new form of church, one that we weren't used to. We're Swiss brethren and we were trying to adopt more of a urban mission and it's kind of caught them at a surprise because I'm pretty loud and I say what I think and they're trying to love on me and not show it, but it causes pains in both directions. Harkin House Ministry, the way it works is men come out of prison and they try to tell me stories. I grew up as a debt collector for motorcycle clubs and so I'm used to calling people out and bringing them to accountability and I have the same kind of thing when it comes to homelessness. I hear people in the streets of Chambersburg come up to me and all the time they'll ask me, can I have this? Can I have that? 
you know, I've had people ask me for as little as $25 and for as much as $58,000, which I was impressed when they asked for $58,000. I was like, how do you fathom that? But at that point in my recovery, Chambersburg Christian Fellowship was mentoring me about my debt load. And so I had to tell them, I owe $38,000. If you give me 38, dollars I'll give you 58. dollars And they went away. Accountability with giving to people in the streets has been my call to arms. I have people con- constantly come to me and ask me, can I have this? Can I have that? Can you pay for a motel room? And I say, excuse me, stop. Let's talk about this. Is this sustainable? And most times it isn't because they only want temporary measures. And I'm not willing to give a temporary measure. I want a permanent solution, which means I want to get down in the dirt with them in their problem and help wrestle them back to a church like this. My resurrection off the streets came from a Mennonite church. I told you I'm a sex offender. Nobody wanted me. My family didn't want me. I lost everything. And in that pit called prison, or the modern-day monastic community, as I call it, I sought God, and I fell fell off of my bed, and I tapped out. And I said, I can't, you can help. And I wanted to be, I wanted the problem fixed, but I didn't want to fix me. And the unfortunate thing, when you change with Christ, you fix you. And then if you have that kind of standard, you don't let people push you around. Or at least I don't. So my whole thing with working with people in the streets who are homeless or helpless is I question their motives. And I am, I think, one of the healthiest things that we can say to people on the street who are like, you know, that guy at Walmart, oh, I just need five dollars for this or that. I always say to them, no. And I don't have any problem with that. I don't believe that we're supposed to give all the time. I was reading, and I'm trying to do this quick and off the cuff, and I'm sure I'm going to forget about 50 things, and Joe's going to say, you're done. And I'm like, ugh, I didn't get it all out. But that's okay. Um, Give me a second. I have to pull to it. Because I wrote about 75 minutes worth of notes, and I'm probably going to get to two of them. (laughs) If that makes any sense to anybody. Okay, I was reading in Matthew 25. Because that's always the call for people when they're dealing with people in the streets. Matthew says, we got to help them. But when I read it, I read that the ten virgins took responsibility Five of them took responsibility for their actions, and the other five were trying to manipulate the five that took care of their reaction or their actions. And if you read down the lesson on the ten talents, I believe says invest your money wisely. And there's a reason he's saying take responsibility and invest, because at the end of it, they sh- the sheep from the goat. And see, sometimes I think people in the street that are coming to us and say give, 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 with the sad story, put the little. You know, I, I need for so much. We have to discern, are they manipulating us? Or do they really need help? But I found out, I, this is my summation on that one, was people are God's investment, so we should take care of God's investment with love. And I'm not sounding like I love these people. Unfortunately, I think the best love we can give them is to say No. You know, there are many missions going on in this room right here. And if we gave to every homeless person as much as they wanted, there'd be nothing for the missions that are doing the work. There's a social response to homelessness. There's a political one and there's a spiritual one. Anything less than a spiritual response to people who are begging or needing assistance on an ongoing thing is probably the only response. That's why I'm here, because my church, Chambersburg Christian Fellowship, I'm putting a plug in for them, I'm representing, is they pulled me out of apathy by saying no to me and asking me to step up and take care of my problems, my responsibility of financial liabilities. And in that, they didn't go for the outside. They didn't say suit up and show up. They said show up, and eventually your heart will also show up. Thank you, Patrick. Questions now from the panelists. Go ahead, Wolf. Um, I myself am a, a veteran, and, um, and I'm sure there's some other veterans here in the assembly. 
And uh, I think it's pretty well known that there's a lot of veterans out there that are homeless. Is there any unique approach that you would have? And, um, you know, I, I just feel we have so much to offer as a peace church to these veterans that are, you know, spiritually uh, injured and, and destitute in many ways. In North Carolina, there's a place called Raise You Up Ministry. I flew down there to look at it. And they deal with people because, first of all, you're hungry. They feed you. Second of all, they give you clothes. Third, they work with you to build a resume. And if you come up missing and you're gone for three weeks, they keep your resume and they follow you over and give you a chance to fill it. Raise You Up Ministry in North Carolina is trying to completely heal somebody by all aspects. They, they have job training. They have mentoring. One of the things they do is Operation Hugs. How many of us are willing to walk across the street and grab somebody that stinks and hug them? There's something that happens when you love on a human being who's been in a war or been on the streets for a long time and you just hug them. And, and that's what I like about Raise You Up Ministry. And I would aspire to do that, but I've got too many irons in my fire. You were saying about saying no when they ask for things. I, I understand. I agree with that. I do not give any money to drug addicts and things like that. What do you say about offering them a meal? When they come to my house, we feed them sometimes. Uh, or in the street, I buy some for them. I like that. It suggests that's that actually one of the best ones. It's hard for them to sell the food that you're giving them, especially if they're eating in front of you. One time somebody asked me for money and I said, well, all I have is a credit card. They said, well, I take credit cards. And I, <laughs> I wasn't prepared for that. But, but food is the grease, our social grease. Boston has learned this. State College has learned this. That you bring people in for a meal and that's a time when you break bread. Jesus taught us to feed each other. I love to feed people. I'm sorry I didn't get to it because I was spinning. Did I answer your question? I have another question. Uh -oh. uh, so, should we be scared of homeless people? No. Unless they have a knife, no. If they have a knife, run away. If they have a gun, run towards them. <laughs> you won't understand. That's a street term, because with a gun, they can't get it off as quick as you can tackle them. <laughs> I'm sorry. It depends, because there's different... Now I'm going to step into something really weird. Demonic possession, and we all see it working with people in the street. If they're demonically oppressed and Satan doesn't like what you're doing, you may get attacked. Do we take one for the team? Sometimes we have to discern if we have our family to avoid this. And I think as we go in towards the end times, repossession in the name of Christ will be the thing that we need to focus on. I let the cat out of the bag. And then maybe just a follow-up. So if I'm out on the streets shit, and I see a homeless person, is it good? Like, can I make a change in that person's life just as an individual? Or should I be directing them to an institution or somebody who's a professional? With it? I think we're called to call each man to Christ. And, in, and usually if they're truly homeless and they don't want to hear it, they'll tell you immediately. They'll say, I want money. Oh, I don't have money. And they'll tell you to go away. So you're safe in that bet. If they don't want to hear it, they'll run away. But if you feel in tune or if you feel you need to, just keep talking to them about Christ. I like the term irritant for Christ. Ask Chambersburg Christian Fellowship. Anybody here from Chambersburg Christian Fellowship, ask them about irritation for Christ because I've been practicing it with them. You want to know what irritation... I don't say no, and I don't back up. And if I feel adamant about something, I will tell you what I think. And that may seem unchristlike, but from the world I came from, anything less than a knife fight or a baseball bat is a peaceful protest. And so what I'm doing is I'm talking to people in the way I know how to speak. And there's been many people in State College that I've challenged we were doing something, me and Brian were having a discussion, I didn't like what he said, and I got mad and I hung up. And I let the phone go for five minutes and I called back and I imagined him going, oh no, not him again. But he answered. 
And I said, my intention was this. And because of the problem, I went around it. I want to continue on and do what I intended to do. I'm willing to irritate you if I believe it will help. So, Patrick, how has the, the year of, of COVID with all, the, with all of that going on, how has that affected the homelessness on our streets and cities in America? Do you have a sense, sense for that? In the last year, I got involved in a food distribution thing, which was a farm to family program. We handed out 700,000 gallons of milk. And uh, seven teams or seven states, we put out 140 million pounds of food that was given to us by the USDA. But there's been abuses. Anytime the government gets involved in something, it goes awry. Um, it didn't impact those locally. It, you know, it dumped food. Home, homeless people in, living in a car can only take so many boxes of 35 pounds of food that needs refrigerated. So it was over the top, but people took it. People were afraid. Um, Raise You Up Ministry is struggling to regain the momentum they had. Kingdom Fellowship Weekend, you guys weren't here last year. They asked me two years ago to sit up on this panel. Do you know what it's like? I'm impatient. Two years of waiting to be here. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> but COVID has impacted our society. Right now, I'm struggling with something in my chest, and it's like an overabundance of stuff, and I'm not going to get personal, but I think everybody has been impacted, whether we believe it or not. It is a real situation. But I believe that Jesus Christ will protect me from it, and I'm not going to. I, I will mask up if I'm asked to, but I choose not to. Mostly, I answered questions. Thank you, Patrick. We will now transition to uh, Mark. If you would go ahead, I'm supposed to address the subject of the homeless, loving the homeless, fatherless. Thank you, thank you, fatherless. I enjoyed your talk. I was getting carried away with that. Uh, the ministering to the fatherless. What is a fatherless person? What does a father supposed to do? A father is, um, is the father directs his children, the disciples them, teaches them how to live, and then gives them approval. And that approval from a father is one of, is one of such a beautiful, wonderful thing. To know that you're approved by your father. But there's thousands, there's millions of people out there that don't have that. In a crowd like this, I won't even try to guess a percentage that have not had that fatherly love, father care, father direction, and father approval. When you work with people, you run with this all over. When in the beginning of my ministry years ago, there was a young lady who, her father was alive, but he was not a father to her. Her family was dysfunctional. And she became a part of the church. And one day I was talking to her. I said, Nudia, you realize that because you do not have a father in your home, in your life, you are weak towards men. I want to warn you, please, be careful. She, and by then she was crying. She said, yes, yes, yes. I said, be careful. Your need of a father can lead you to the wrong man. Some years later, I tried to be a father to her. We spent many hours together and praying with her. I tried to be a father to her. Some years later, she left the Lord. She left the church for a man, an unmarried man. And she's not married today. She's still single. There was another brother in the church. Big guy with a big beard. Stands there, tears running down his cheek and said, Mark, why couldn't I have a father? Why couldn't I have a father? His father was, when he was just an infant, his father was killed. His father was drunk and in a bed with another woman when they killed him. He says, why my father and where is my father? Why can't I have a father? When he came to the Lord, asked Dorcas. He lived not far from where we did about every day. He'd stop by. He'd sit on our porch and he wanted to talk to me about the day. After our service, almost every service in the beginning, he said, come Mark, I want to talk to you. Take me out and talk. Some of the brethren struggled a little bit with that. But I was okay because he was needing a father. He was needing a father. Not too long ago, two years ago or so, my son built a house. And uh, there was two carpenters that were there. 
and they worked with us and Dorcas and some of the others went down and helped paint and they sang and they worked and, and the impact was so on these carpenters that when they left they had tears in their eyes. But before they left, a young man said to me, I want to talk to you. So he went outside and we sat down on the log and he started telling me about his problems, about his life. Tears started coming. I put my arms around him, gave him the love, the acceptance. He ended up almost ro rolled up in my lap. He came down and just rolled. He just cried and cried and cried because he needed a father. There's another young man who his father committed suicide. They found him hanging in a tree. His bro oldest brother was murdered. We think, we're not sure, probably because of drug-related things, rather drug trafficking, we're not sure. Another brother was in an accident was killed, a brother who was not living a Christian life. After he came to the Lord, and I talked to him once about it. He just sat there and just cried and cried and cried. I prayed for him. You might think it's funny, but one day we had a church activity where we were eating together, and I was sitting on a bench, and he was sitting beside me maybe 20 minutes, sitting there beside me with his arm around me like this. If you'd have seen it, I even felt a little bit different. You know, here's this young man. Uh, how old is he? 18? I forget. Uh, 17, 18, 19. And he's sitting there for the longest time. He's sitting his arm around me. But I understood, and I didn't mind. And there's many more stories that I could say. How do we help these people? If we only focus, this young man that was a carpenter that was crying in my lap, I invited him to Bible studies, and I invited him to the, the real father. That has not happened yet. I'm still waiting. Because just to sit down and listen to his story and hear him crying and giving him love doesn't take care of the problem. Some of these people have their, their, their emotions, their feelings, all like, like feelers out front like this. Very sensitive to how they're treated because, you know, poor me, I didn't have a father. Some of you can, can relate to this. The solution to this problem is not only focusing on their lack of a father, the lack that they have in their life. It is taking them to Jesus Christ. And there's a point of death on the cross of Jesus where we repent and we die. And the only thing is important is my father loves me. My father loves me. And our, our responsibility is take these people to find the real father. And if I can be a halfway father to them and love them and put my arms around them, but I am leading them to the real father. Psalms 68 says, A father to the fatherless and the judge of the widows is God in his holy habitation. Have you noticed how often the bother, the God addresses this? James, it says, Pure religion and undefiled before God and the Father is this, to visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction and keep himself unspotted from the world. But the, the, the goal is taking these people and finding the real father. You know, I've come to conclude, you know, God designed the family. God planned who fathers should be. And that came from his heart, from who he is. He has the father heart for us. And not many of us, how many of you? I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. I would say more than half of you felt a lack of your father, a lack of his love and his approval. How do we solve that? Sit around and cry about it all our lives? Find the real father. Our, our, our physical father is only a shadow of the real one. And if we can lead people to find God, this man whose father was murdered, he's in the church, and he doesn't need me as much anymore. He doesn't call me like he used to call me all the time. And always, He doesn't need me as much anymore. Why? He found the father, the real one. And all of us fathers are just an example to lead people to the father. And if there's someone here tonight who has not found the, their father, he's waiting on you, the real one, not the shadow, the real one.
Thank you, Mark. Questions now from uh, up here? Who would like to go? Who would like to be the first? Wolf? Um, just this whole idea of um, people that have had bad relationships with their fathers. Um, the whole gospel message is, is skewed and distorted because they don't look at God as a father. That might be a bad thing for them. Uh, can you give us some insight on how to project the love of the Lord when they have this distorted view of who God is as a father? Wow. Good question, brother. Like Patrick was saying, uh, we, we give them love, we give them acceptance, but we also say, listen, this. You need to change this. A father does that. A father directs and say, do this. Hey, what about this? Let's straighten this up. You take responsibility for this. Because what, what humanity wants to do, what a lot of us want to do is, is blame people around me and sit around and just feel pity myself and don't get anywhere. We need to help them to be responsible for their own lives. Uh, this young man that I said would sit with his arm around him, he's in the southern part of the country now teaching school. I hardly have contact with him anymore, but I trust him. God has done the work, and, um, but they need to take responsibility. Not more I'm trying to think how to put this. When I came into the churches, they were asking me if I wanted a heavenly father. I didn't like what the earthly guy who wanted to be my father did to me. I was a little boy on my knees, and he did things to behind my back that he shouldn't have done. And there was a lot of things that went on. So when they said, do you want an earthly father? I said, I don't even like my, my, do you want a heavenly father? I don't even like my earthly father. How do we begin to repair them damages done? I don't, I'm sorry I threw a big one at you. Well, Brother Patrick, maybe you can answer your own question better than I can. But um, one thing that I have found in ministering, working with people, is I need to be very close to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the comforter. He is the great healer. It's not me. And so often I say, Lord, what do I tell him now? How do I work with this? But um, I'd like to hear more of you say about what happened in your life when it was that way. First of all, I want to show you something. Stand up. This is the first thing that helps heal people. Ask Joe, Brother Joel about it. I almost broke his back. <laughs> okay, another, another question. I have found this, and once a person knows that I really, really love him, he'll take about anything that I need to tell him. But I need to first confirm that he is loved and accepted by me. Another question. So just thinking about the fathers that are here, and you mentioned how it's possible to have a father, but he's not emotionally present. And so really the person is, is maybe fatherless. How, what, what would you say to fathers um, yeah, to, to warn them about yeah, being emotionally absent from their children. You're talking about, I'm talking to the fathers now for their children. That's partially what I was trying to address this earlier today, and I really, I really put in a plea for that. We men need broken hearts. We need to feel for our, our young children, we need to make it important to connect when they have struggles and when they have hard problems, sit beside them, walk with them. The Holy Spirit is called the great comforter. And if he's in us, we should do that to our children. We need to take time. I say again, please take time. Let your children feel loved. Even if they blunder and make mistakes and fail, even if they fall, you're going to address that into pornography or whatever, you show them that they're still loved by their father. And then... With the help of the Holy Spirit, direct them. 
lead them. And some of that takes time. Sometimes we'd like to have that happen in one session, two sessions. Sometimes it takes quite a few more. Yes, I would say please. And I, I'm not saying this because my daughter's here and she knows. I was far from a perfect father. But in my working with people, when your children are small, please, please listen to them. They're silly questions. They talk and they talk and they talk. Please, Father, listen, listen, listen to their hearts. When they come home and they say something, I could tell you a story about Dorcas, but I won't. <laughs> you know, but there's things that we laugh about. They're not important. They're little minor things. But if it hurts them, take time and listen so that when they get bigger things, more serious things, they come to Dad and say, talk to Dad about That brings a... Uh, uh to memory a, a story I had with my oldest son, and he was of that age where he kept asking questions. Why this? Why that? And he'd ask it over and over and over again. And, and you know, much to my shame, I, you know, I was exasperated. I said, why? why are you asking this over and over again? And his response was, well, Papa, I love hearing your voice. So, um, you know, one of the recurrent themes I hear here is you have to take time. And, um, you know, uh, we're at that time, a lot of you people here are young. Um, you know, at your, on your deathbed, you're not going to be saying, I wish I spent more time at the office. You know, invest in your relationships now. Uh, there's no substitute for time. I know when we're stretched for time, our nerves get stressed. Uh, we get stressed with each other, and things go out the window. Family devotions, one-on-one um, -on -one time, these sort of things. Okay, thank you. Mark, we'll transition now to you, Wolf. So if you take your mic, you can go ahead and present your prepared remarks. I really appreciate what the, uh, the brothers here have just presented. And to be honest, uh, I, I long a little bit for that because oftentimes these are, are subjects that we can really get behind in a unified voice and spirit. And uh, to be honest, I, I don't like conflict. Um, I'm conflict averse. Uh, so I really appreciate how the Lord used uh, Brother Dr. Finney last night to, to bring a message. Um, of zeal, and uh, and so I appreciate that. But what I'm going to talk, going to present now, is a, a complex issue in which uh, I sometimes feel like I'm caught in the middle between the Hatfields and the McCoys. Uh, are you for again vaccines? And I get that often. That ask that kind of frequently. Well, I just hope you hire, hold your fire until the question periods where, where you guys can fire away some questions at me. I'd, I'd appreciate that. Specifically, if you want to hear about the COVID vaccines, you can ask about that. But today I'm going to be talking specifically about uh, tainted vaccines. Um, and many of you are, will be happy to know that I'm not an anti-vaxxer. And other, others will be feeling ready to get up because of that. Uh, on the other hand, uh, still many others of you will be happy to know that I'm not a, a pusher, a vaccine pusher. And yet more will be ready and feeling like they have to get up and leave because of that. Even amongst our, 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 our people here, there's, there's a wide range of views. And it just seems like this is a very divisive topic. So to those that remain, I'd like to thank you with the words of our Lord. But blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear, Matthew 13, 16. There have been many great patriarchs. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob quickly come to mind, but I can't recall any of them from being a physician. So I belong to that increasingly endangered species of physicians that believes in not telling you what to do in a patriarchal manner, but in providing you with information and a little advice, and praying that you make godly decisions from that in a clean conscience with the Holy Spirit. 
In this area of COVID vaccines, vaccines are big news, but I have specifically been asked to address the issue of the use of fetal tissue in the production of vaccines. To be brief, this is a fact. It's not conjecture. It's not conspiracy theory that aborted fetuses have, fetuses have been used to develop and produce, produce certain, mainly childhood vaccines, rubella, hepatitis A, some of the polio vaccines, and some COVID vaccines. Now, for most of these, there are ethical alternatives. But it started in the 1960s when a scientist took a previously healthy aborted female fetus. And fetus, by the way, means offspring or little one. So he di dissected the, the lungs out of this little one and started to grow them in a lab. Under these conditions, the tissue can keep growing almost indefinitely, producing a huge amount of tissue. This tissue is then infected with the weakened form of the target virus, and the culture is purified, and then it's used to produce a vaccine, which is injected into patients, stimulating a person to produce their own antibody, antibodies to that specific virus. If a person is then exposed to that virus in the usual uh, manner, and, and just by contact with other people, the antibodies will attack it, and so they will prevent infections. Now, to be sure, vaccines are 85 to 95% effective, but they're not 100% effective. There have been some objections to this objection over using fetal tissue, even in our own circles. And so I'm going to go over a couple of those briefly. Number one, no further abortions are needed. While it's true that the original abortions happened many years ago, science has developed an insatiable appetite for new lines. The cell nines lines are not immortal. That means there's only a fixed amount of tissue that you're going to get there, and it's actually a huge amount, but it's not, they're not immortal. And they genetically start breaking down after about 40 uh, doublings. If there is no conscientious objection, unbridled science acquires an insatiable appetite for more tissue and more abortions. There have since been established a number of new cell lines, each requiring many abortions to develop, often by competing companies, since these cell lines of humanity come under copyright laws. It's no different, and number two, second argument, is that it's no different than if a homicide victim donated his body to science. While I would agree that this would not be an ethical problem if he signs his own donor card, or if his family agrees to it, but what if the family member ordered the hit? Would that be ethical? This is the case of using aborted fetal tissue, where the mother usually signs off on that order. Proper consent is no problem, is no small problem today. Christians in China are executed and their body parts harvested without proper consent. This is a real problem, and it is, and it's no conspiracy theory either. Lastly, and most problematic, is the spirit of moral relativism in our day. The Apostle Paul states in Galatians 5.19, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Of these vaccines, it has been said, it happened a long time ago, it's done with. There are worse things in life, let's move on. We've heard these words before, and we should carefully consider where this leaven will lead us. It reminds me of a leadership conference I went to a few years ago, put on by an otherwise staunchly Christian Protestant group. In it, the subject matter somehow migrated to the topic, uh, topic of scrambled eggs. Bear with me here. The minister was actually speaking about divorce and remarriage. It happened a long time ago. It's done with. There are worse things in life. Just move on. He said, you can't unscramble eggs. Much to my shame, I didn't speak up, but I know no that I should have said, but I know someone who does. So this ultimately leads us back to the theme of this conference. How do we spread life in a culture of death? In regard to vaccines, we know that just like with divorce and remarriage, God can unscramble eggs. The process may involve great hardships and stir up great scorn. Non-resistance does not mean non-conflict. It's been said that in a time of universal deceit, telling the truth is a revolutionary act. In this day and age of the cancel culture, taking a stand may cost jobs, freedom, and the esteem of our friends and neighbors. But have we forgotten to, gotten to the point 
of apathy where we can so easily dismiss what God calls an abomination, shedding of innocent blood. I pray not. I read, I read a bumper sticker here just today that said, don't put a question mark where God puts a period. Paul says, we are fools for God, Christ's sake. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Which camp are we in? But to the souls in the world seeking an alternative to the fatalism of the day, if we are perceived as making vaccine decisions out of a spirit of self-sacrifice and service to the Lord, God can use us as fools and revolutionaries to spread the message of life in a culture of death. Thank you, Wolf. Who will be the first to present a question here? Sure, I'll ask a question. Um, so I really appreciate your what you said about allowing people to, to make decisions and not being patriarchal in, in your practice. Where would you direct people to do their research and um, to make those decisions? Maybe if, if we don't have a doctor like you around in our community. In this modern age, it's so easy to have your own sense of reality. You can watch your own news. Uh, you can be with your own people. You can do your own thing. And everything will seem like a, a, just a different sense of reality that's totally opposite of someone next to you. So I would go out and seek opposite opinions. And that takes, it takes a lot of doing. And, and, of course, seeking the Lord's wisdom in all of these things. Um, you know, the... Uh, just looking at my own family, um, we have one part of my family that says, well, how can you not really care about my health? And the other side says, well, how can you not care about my livelihood? And, and, and this kind of thing. But this is where the culture of life comes through. If we answer those questions, not so much in terms of what's good for me, uh, but what's good for you, and, and how can I be self-sacrificing in this way? May I ask you a question? Let's, uh, let's say I was sitting in your office, and we'll just let them listen. Uh, I had COVID in June. I was in the hospital 15 days, pneumonia in my lungs and things. And I come out now, and praise the Lord, I'm just about normal. I praise the Lord for that. But the doctor in town tells me I need to get vaccinated. Um, I don't think so. I'm, I'm hoping I have antibodies. So I, I come up here and I think, oh, I'm covered and protected. The Lord above all. But if I were telling you this, what would you tell me? Would you tell me to go look on the sites and do the research? Would you just tell me what you would tell me if I was in your office? No, I wouldn't tell you what it. If, you're, if we have a relationship, I would tell you what I would do in this situation, and that's usually what people ask. Doc, what would, what, what would you do? And um, basically, this idea of COVID passports, uh, you know, it, it defies reason. It's more of a practical application. It's made by policymakers. Who, and and the, if you look at most conflicts in life, it revolves around a degeneration of relationships. And the relationship of the population now, the people now with the medical community, has, it's dismal. It's, it will take years and years to build that relationship of trust back again. But policymakers want a COVID passport because, you know, if you tell me I had COVID in the past, they're going to say, well, maybe you did, maybe you didn't. I want to see it written down. Okay. Scientifically speaking, if you had COVID, you probably have antibodies that are as good or better than the shot. Okay. So medically speaking, you probably don't. And now there actually is a test and people that have given blood can, you know, they'll know this, but you, there's a certain level of antibodies. You can measure how many antibodies you have to COVID. So, you know, a halfway thing would be, let, 
let's see if you have an antibody response. Some people that have had COVID they don't have an appreciable level, and it waxes, wanes over time. Same thing with vaccines. So to answer your question, should I have the vaccine? Um, you know, we may get to the point where the uh, the authorities are saying. You need to have this if you want to go and exchange goods in a store. You need to have this if you want to fly. You need to have this if you want to go to school. Uh, and then we'll have to decide, is this, is this an issue that's um, a religious conviction? I will not use aborted fetal tissue in the vaccines. Or is it a personal preference? I don't like the idea of having a, an experimental uh, vaccine in me. And it may be a religious issue, too, if you're talking about, you know, defending your children. Uh, but the uh, two of the vaccines, uh, the Moderna and Pfizer, are mRNA. These are new vaccines. They've been around for a year. No, normally, it takes approximately seven years to get this stuff uh, through the approval process. And there's a purpose for that. It's not just going through bean counter to bean counter to bean counter and, and bureaucrat to bureaucrat because it gives us time to look at the long-term effects. Um, so those two vaccines are experimental. I would be, the, the, uh, the reservations I have them are hypothetical, except for a few things like heart inflammation, um, which a lot of those are just, they, it's a transient thing. It's not a permanent damage. The, the cardiomyoid, uh, cardiomyopathies, those are permanent. Pericarditis is usually gonna be a temporary thing. Um, but, in, even in those situations, what we know are complications from the mRNA vaccines, um, the risks, and it depends on your, your age group, you know, if you have, if you have complications, um, your, your risk of dying from COVID and you're over 65, 75 is about 6%. That makes a lot of sense for hypothetically a 1 in 100,000 chance of a complication. Um, so it depends on your situation. Now, there is the, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is based on fetal tissue. Now, I think we need to be, um, uh, we need to be faithful uh, and follow God's words and not compromise these things. So those three vaccines that are available, they cause a lot of problems with people in, in using them, and understandably so. You know, I think as a physician, to just write that off and say, take it anyway, you'll be okay. That's not responsible because one of the main tenets of medicine is informed consent. Do you know the risks? Do you know the benefits? If if the people that are be, that are shouting out or the, calling out that these potential conflicts are, if they're being labeled as misinformation and you're not getting that information, I think that's from a medical professional standpoint, that's that's no good. That's not right. So. Um, but I think we need to be um, we need to be faithful, and as it happens, uh, there is a new vaccine coming out. It's called the Novavax. It is not based off of fetal tissue. It is not mRNA. It's a traditional vaccine, and it should be out in the next few months. Personally, um, because there is a need in society to increase that herd immunity, uh, the people that have not had the vaccine have not had COVID or have not had it within the last nine to 12 months, because over time, that's, COVID is, a, is a, a cold virus. The reason why there's no cure for the common cold is because it changes so quickly. The reason why we have a flu vaccine every year is because it changes so quickly. COVID is like this. So because you had it uh, nine months ago or whatever, uh, it doesn't mean you're immune to it now. So um, I forgot where I was gonna lead with this, but. Um, my own family, I, I would be okay with the, the Novavax. Um, it, uh, yeah. Go ahead, Tim. Go ahead. Do I have a moral dilemma, not talking about COVID, but if there's a disease going through the world and killing a lot of people and the only vaccine available is one that was based on um, fetal cell tissue, do I have a moral dilemma or is that able to solve it? Okay, well, the, the premise is not really true. Uh, there isn't just one vaccine. I think there might be 
I can't think of a vaccine that there isn't an alternative to. And, and so to say that we have to do this because it's the only thing, the premise is incorrect. Uh, now, there, there's a social contract in society. Society, the, the doctor or the, uh, the medical establishment says, okay, you have a risk of these vaccines for these side effects. They, they are pretty small. We're talking about in the area of one to 100,000 uh, to some serious complications. Um, in exchange for taking on that risk, we are going to try and protect society and try and eliminate a lot of these viruses. And, and all my, fa my family has all had all the required vaccines. Um, and uh, it, we had to go through some lengths to do it. I mean, I had to go to Japan to get some of these or had import them from Japan. It's a very difficult process. But if the authorities want us to have this in order to protect society, this is part, part of the social contract, then I do not think it's, uh, and we're taking risk to do that, the risk of the side effects. It's, it's not an unreasonable thing to say, okay, I want an ethical alternative. Now, this is in a society where we have options and we can, we can turn these things down. The authorities have given us that. It, will, it may very well come to the point where that is not an option. And they will, may say, like in New York and some other states, they've taken that away, the religious exemptions away. Now you have to decide, is this a religious conviction or is this a personal preference? If this is a religious conviction, then we have no choice but to follow the Lord. If this is a personal preference, then let's have that discussion. You know, how far are you going to go with this in defying the authorities? And, and defying the authorities, I, I think there's a lot of miscommunication in, in, our, uh, in our people here. Death has lost its sting for us, okay? So wearing a mask... If we get it, we're, I think the vast majority of us are ready to go on to our reward, okay? Yes. And however, so wearing a mask may not have that high a priority um, uh, in our lives, but we have to be very careful. To the other 90% of the population, they see not wearing a mask as an act of defiance. Okay. And, um, and we don't want to be drawn into that trench of us versus them, because we need to follow the Holy Spirit, and that's who we owe our allegiance to. And we have to be careful of how, uh, how we're perceived in that. Whether or not you think the mask works, and I wish I had more time to, to dis discuss the efficacy of these things, the scientific stuff, but it really doesn't matter. You know, if the authorities say you need to wear a mask, and we're, we're kind of beyond that until the next wave comes, maybe. We're beyond that. It doesn't matter if the mask works or not. If the authorities say wear it, we should wear it. Thank you, Wolf. Now we're going to transition here. Tim, would you go ahead and um, share your prepared remarks? Oh, and sorry for that. That came across a little bit uh, journalistic. So, Sorry to change the subject. It's a very interesting one. Let's think about something different. I remember it was about five years ago. A large group of men here at KFW met to talk about the issue of sexual purity. Brothers Ken Miller and Joel Martin led a call for all those who had viewed pornography in the last six months to step forward in confession. As a larger and larger percentage of the group came forward, Brother Miller stood there weeping, pleading for God's mercy on our people. Would it be any different today? What is an addiction? An addiction is any behavior that you use to cope with the pain in your life. It is compulsive. You do it again and again, although you try to stop. And it is destructive. You know it hurts yourself and those you love. A partial list would include drugs, gambling, food, working, shopping, phones and social media, pornography, masturbation, unhealthy relationships, and the list could go on and on. All addictions are sin because they dishonor the Holy Spirit. 
Do you not know that your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were bought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. All addictions can be overcome by the grace of God. But when you are tempted, God will also provide a way out so that you can endure it. I'm focusing on sexual addictions because it's part of my story and because I think it's prevalent, destructive, and largely unaddressed in our churches and our communities. It's not just a problem out there. Studies show that more than 68% of Christian men and 25% of Christian women struggle with unwanted sexual behaviors. Sexual addictions destroy the body. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a person commit are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. The bad news is that pornography physically corrupts the brain, your body's control center. Over time, the pleasure center of the brain becomes wired for addictive behavior, just like a drug addict. The good news is that by God's grace, anyone can be transformed by the renewing of their mind. The brain can be rewired according to God's design. One can be transformed into the image of Christ from one degree of glory to another. Private sin kills spiritual life. In the words of Dr. Ted Roberts, there is no greater prison than the one people find themselves in when they love Christ with all their hearts but are slowly choking to death as the noose of sexual addiction strangles the spiritual life out of them. And that was me, but I've been set free. So brothers, what shall we do? First of all, admit that we have a problem. Graciously do some asking around, some surveys. Determine the magnitude of the problem in your church, in your community. And secondly, be zealous in addressing the problem. Stop. Take care of this before you go any further. Put the programs in place to offer spaces for healing. Start recovery groups first within your own church and then out to reach out to your community. In brief, here are some of the tools that are a means of God's grace in fighting addictions and bringing healing. The first tool is true repentance. Not negative self-talk not self-condemnation, but a godly sorrow that produces earnestness, eagerness to clear yourselves, indignation, alarm, longing, concern, and readiness to see justice done. The second tool is effective accountability. Not simply a weekly report of sin that was committed, but a time-intensive daily commitment to report thoughts, feelings, temptations, and to pray for each other. A willingness to develop and carefully track positive habits as well as the spiritual disciplines. The third tool is radical amputation. First of all, in your thinking, develop knee-jerk reactions to lust. Cut it off. Scripture memorization actually rewires the corrupted brain. Secondly, in your time, limit the time you spend alone. Relapse most often happens alone late at night. Thirdly, access. If you must, get rid of your smartphone, get rid of your internet connection, install accountability software on all your devices. Alarmingly, studies show that about 30% of total data transferred on the internet is pornography. The fourth tool is to revisit the past. Trauma or pain from the past most often becomes the driver behind the addiction. Talk through that pain. Pray through it. Identify the lies that it made you believe, and then counteract those lies with scripture promises. The fifth tool is thankfulness. Covetousness and greed are at the heart of sexual immorality, and the regular giving of thanks is a solution. The sixth tool is a clear action plan. Identify what a relapse is, 
what conditions are usually in place when it happens, and what actions you will take to escape. In conclusion, be positive and focus on health. Talk openly and appropriately within your church communities about what healthy sexuality looks like. Satan took the human sex drive, which is something that was very good, and he distorted it into something destructive. Addictions, whatever they are, kidnap the pleasure center of our brains, which God gave us to make our life fulfilling and enjoyable. Pleasure is good. There are healthy ways to deal with the pain in our lives. Let's not put up with any of Satan's destructive lies. There's hope. The law of the spirit of life has set us free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin, addictions, and death. Thank you, Tim. Lots to, lots to ponder there. And we'll take a few minutes here and answer questions that we'd like to, like to direct at Tim up here. I appreciate that, Brother Tim. I uh, appreciate your openness and honesty. Um, this is a topic that is extremely difficult for many congregations to confront honestly and openly. Do you have any insight on how to begin that conversation in our congregations? Or any, any anecdotes do you have or anything like that? Yeah, sure. I think you could pretty easily um, just gather the men together at some point, and the ladies as well, um, in a separate occasion, and talk about it. And there's probably somebody in your church or your community that could share their story. When someone shares their story, it's really powerful. And the people sitting there that thought they were all alone in this realize that I'm not all alone. And that there is actually hope because there's stories of people being set free. So just getting together as, as a group of men and then also ladies, um, it's not just a man's problem. Um, and talk about it, and then, yeah, hopefully there, there's plenty of tools, there's books um, that you can, you can go through. Um, if you search for it, there's plenty of tools there to address the problem. Do you have any specific resources in mind that, that would be helpful? There's a book called Finally Free by Heath Lambert. It's a very good start, very, very based in the Bible and in God's grace. And there's other resources that you have to kind of weed through things that um, might be objectionable. Um, but there's a course called Sexual Integrity 101 from puredesire.com uh, that gets into the problems in the brain and revisiting trauma, um, addresses some of those things that are often left out. Uh, Tim, I really, really appreciate this. I, it's part of my ministry, helping people. And I need more tools. I need more help. I have discovered it's not enough at home to do that in the church. Men confess, bring it up front. Um, but I've discovered that's not enough just to make a confession and just let it go. I need to keep walking with them. I, I was just adding these, these resources. Thank you for asking that question. Do these... Do these books also address the issue of group accountability and that type of thing? You know, we Anabaptists function a little different than Protestants do. Um, well, what I was going to suggest, Tim, I was going to ask you, do you have your, your material organized where you could send it to me? That's what we, we need more tools. The Church of Jesus Christ, Brother Tim, needs tools. We need things to work with. You know what scares us? Scares us. What do we do? But there are tools. There are ways. And I know there's young men that are free in victory. And there's others still struggling. So if you could give us some tools from an Anabaptist or do these other, this one, your first one you mentioned, the see we talk about a brotherhood accountability, open honesty, uh, or, or if not, you write one. Would you please? In the book, Finally Free, he gives a whole chapter to accountability and 
has some really, really good insights. Um, one of the best is that accountability needs to be involved early rather than late. And finally, free by Heath Lambert. And if you have, it's it's worth taking the time read a variety of books. Um, not not one any book will have the complete solution. You get all the tools. I put a, hello. I want to put a plug in for somebody about something that they did. Is that okay? Jason Willis did a um, a video or a sermon on overcoming temptations. It's on sound faith. If anyone doesn't know about it, get with somebody from Chambersburg. Um, he 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 says that he doesn't like mayonnaise. I'll I'll let the cat out of the bag. So he's never going to be tempted by mayonnaise. And you have to learn to segment your problem to mayonnaise. And I might not be summing it up correctly, but it was very, very profound. And even our young people in our congregation are still talking about that. Um, he suffered with addictions. Even now, I'm 61 years old. My life of pornography started when I was six years old. I told you I'm a sex offender. I'm on a list that you can go and see what I did. And I still don't want to talk about my problem with sexual addiction. I don't want to talk about the problem with self-abuse. I would rather hide that because I want to suit up and show up. Thank you for bringing it out. Group discussion. Brutal, one-on-one, -on -one, and I, I hate to use this term, but confrontational discussions on what you think. If you think I'm doing something wrong, come to me, brother. And if you come to me like, I really think you got a problem with this. If it's not true, I'll let it go. But if it's true, I'll try to defend it. And by my defense of, oh, I got this under control, you know I'm lying. There's a saying about alcoholics, you can tell when they're lying because their lips are moving and their lips aren't moving. So confrontation, because we're unable to deal with this. I don't want to. I would rather hide it. I'm out. So I had a problem with it. I still have a problem with it. My heart's not pure. I'm 61 years old. Oh, I, yeah. Rationalization. I need men to step into my life and say, I love you enough. I'll put my foot in your tail. Maybe I'll, I'll add to that as well, that there's so much shame around this issue. And so it takes a lot of, of grace to approach someone on this. Shame often becomes, feeds that the cycle of addiction. So you do something, you feel very ashamed, you hate yourself, you have a lot of self, negative self-talk, you promise yourself that no one can ever know this and it just drives you further on that cycle. It happens again, you spiral downward. So it takes a lot of grace to address this issue and make sure that we, we don't, we do address the issue, but that we don't shame people for it. May I just put in a little punch again? I know our church, well, we'll know the church is up here, but I know our church leaders Many of them are not going to take the time to do all the research they should do, brother. What you said? They should. Maybe they don't have access. At home, our Spanish people don't have the books you have. I still would put in a plea that someone has experience working with it. And um, some of the things you have, I, if you could put that into a simple little booklet, we could translate it. We could use it. Um, I put together a little course that I, on, on period as far as masturbation. Um, I'm just on my own and I give it out in Spanish, so it doesn't help you any. But um, I would really put in a plea that someone, if someone needs to pay his time, maybe you don't have time, but it'd be worth someone investing some money in making us simple that all of our you know, people could understand it and put this thing in. We need it. And I, I shouldn't, I'm not being critical, but a lot of people are not going to take the time to do all that researching we're talking about, and especially in our Spanish world. So, 
May I make that plea? Someone. Okay, thank you, Tim. Thank you, everybody. We are at about eight o'clock and uh, I've just gotten executive permission that we can go about 10 more minutes or, fi or 15 maximum. And we're gonna switch now to um, questions that, that you haven't seen, but I have here and I have some in my phone and I think that we probably won't get get through um, all of all of them. <clears throat> so there's there's been an abundance of the of the vaccine oriented questions, and I'll start with a couple of those, and then we have a few others as well. This person says, "I agree that." Vaccines made using aborted fetal tissues are unethical, and I believe Christians should refuse them. Should we not be equally against vaccines that have been known to cause infertil infertility and or miscarriages if we are really pro-life? This would include the, the COVID-19 mRNA vaccine. I don't know if you have a... A quick comment on that, or if you, yeah. Well, the uh, the yeah, this is kind of a, a complex issue. That the there is a study that came out recently um, that said that there was no relationship between COVID vaccine, the mRNA, and um, and miscarriages, infertility. I I haven't seen any information about that, um, and. Uh, I, I think uh, as far as the the miscarriages, I think if we need if we go into something that is known to do that, yeah, I think that would be a problem. And I think pregnant people would be wise to be cautious about these things because I don't think that they have been fully studied. There was one study uh, that addressed this one thing. The authors concluded that there was no correlation. However, uh, some other news site said. They took a look at the information, and it's, I'd have to put a PowerPoint thing up to really s say how they came to the conclusion, but they came to an opposite conclusion about early pregnancies. And the way the study was written was very uh, confusing, and, and I could see how they could come with that conclusion, that it would, does cause uh, miscarriages. So what I did was I wrote to the author of the study and asked him, you know, can you clarify this? Uh, these numbers are, are very ambiguous. That email was bounced to the CDC, and they said that they, they, uh, they understand what I'm saying and that there were, I wasn't the only one that brought up that question. And they said they would have a, uh, a follow-up study within the next two months, uh, which I thought, you know, I'm, I'm on the front line, and I deal with patients every day, and I have to deal, deal with these questions. Can I have a little more information? Uh, can I have a little bit more openness? And that's part of the problem is that there, there, uh, there isn't that openness. And do I honestly believe that it causes infertility? No. I mean, the nurses that are taking the vaccines, uh, I think if there was a one-on-one -on -one correlation for infertility, I think we would know very quickly uh, the nurses that were trying to get pregnant that wouldn't. They would, they would come up very quickly with that. That's anecdotal. That's not a study. Uh, I think, but that's the, that's the problem with having these vaccines approved in a year. We don't have the longitudinal information. But to say that these vaccines are, without a doubt, list, linked to infertility and, uh, uh, and miscarriages, that's not an accurate statement. We don't, we don't know. Preliminarily, the studies say that there is not. I'm waiting to see some more clarification. It's, it's, I think it would be worthwhile to, to, to wait for more information. Okay, thank you. May another one directed to you, and then I'll jump to um, uh, Patrick. May we consider, this is as it came to us, may we consider the question of holding fast to voluntary use of vaccines and opposing the idea of required vaccines? I'm, I'm not sure I understand the gist of the question. Uh, if, if it's a matter of principle 
in rejecting the use of required vaccines? Voluntary or? use as opposed to required or, or mandated use. So okay. can you rephrase I, that question? No, I'm going to interpret it in my words, but I, I really think they're saying um, in, informed consent and free choice. Mm -hmm. But if it comes to the place of government mandated, if the government mandates it that we take the shot, um, you know, where do we listen to where, where, where do we listen to Caesar? What do we do when? If and it's probably going to be a I, when. I think that's the this question. Mandated. That's the what, question behind the okay. question. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and again, I, I think uh, we have to separate. Is this and this is a con conversation that needs to be happening on a congregational level. Um, if it's a religious issue, um, if it's religiously based, then I I don't think we have. An option to not do these things. Now, Tim brought up an idea of, well, don't we have this obligation to to um, you know prevent some of these diseases um, when their only vaccine is a tainted vaccine? Well, that's a false dichotomy. If we can come up with COVID vaccines, a number of COVID vaccines in one year, we can come up with a number of ethical vaccines in one year. And so. Um, if enough people are willing to, uh, again, appear fools for Christ, and people will notice, they'll, they'll notice, well, plain community is not getting these vaccines. What are we going to do? If we come to them and say, I'm, gonna, I'm willing to take an ethical vaccine, but I'm not going to take an unethical vaccine, well, if there's enough pressure, then that, that will happen um, if we stand on principle. Now, yeah, I can't answer whether or not you want to take it if it's just if you don't you object to the idea of putting something foreign in your body. Uh, but I'm not sure if that answers the question. Just have to you have to be willing to to sacrifice and and be ostracized. Thank you. I think we'll direct a question to you, Patrick. Um, this one is a common theme. Is it wise to share cash with the homeless? What thoughts do you have regarding the common concern that it fosters entitlement mentality? What? I, I didn't understand the question. I'm sorry. But, but is it wise to share cash with the homeless? I do not share. Will, will, it, will it foster the entitlement mentality? I think is the question. Oh, I got you. Yeah. I never carry cash for a reason because if you ask me, I can truthfully say I don't. The one time I told somebody I have a credit card, they came to me and said, well, I can take a credit card. <sighs> what do you do? Um, I think most times when people ask for something when it comes to cash, they're expecting... I don't like people when they're, oh, I, I need this for you. i, I got to have this for So I'm feeling manipulated. And that's what I reject. I push back. Mm -hmm. um, so anytime somebody's pushing me for an answer right now, you know, why don't you buy this big expensive car? It's only fifty nine ninety nine. I don't want it, and I, I resist salesmen and I resist manipulation of people trying to get money. Now, when someone, when I tell somebody no, it doesn't mean I just like walk past them. No, I don't want to talk to you. I'll stand there and explain why I'm saying no. And if I can help them in another way, the book, When Helping Hurts, offers us a solution that we can help teach them or reignite their own juices to create their funds. And that's not a, a simple, you know, here, let me give you this right now kind of thing. That's something that you have to work. You build a relationship. Sorry. Build, build relationships. Yep. Yeah. Giving money is a temporary fix, but let's think about about long-term long -term solutions. A question for you, Mark. What should I tell my friend whose dad is alive yet uninvolved in her life? Is it her responsibility to go ask another respectable man to be a father figure for her? She's in her 20s, I understand. What do I tell my friend? It's a good question. It's a 
a good question. We can't force the Father. We can't change the Father. We can pray for him. We can love him. And she can do some wonderful things as far as loving and caring for him. Um, but we can't force a change if the Father doesn't, doesn't see his need and is not repentant. But the solution is, there is a father. I think a person like that should find love in the church. And she should find, because, listen, it's true, it's real. When we're repentant and find Jesus, we find a real father. One of the most beautiful phrases is, he loves me. He loves me, the approval I long for can be found in God, even though the Father and other comes around. And so I would say, if, if I'm understanding the question, I would say give that person love and help her find the real Father. And then she can turn around and minister to her Father. And, uh, you know, I do not think that she should go um, complain. I'm thinking a Spanish word here, reclamar. They'll help me. Um, claim, go back and complain and try to demand something. I don't, I don't think that's going to help anything. She's not going to get her father that way, but I think she could find the... He, hey, I'm not going to ask, but I could ask for a raising of hands who have people who have found their needs met emotionally in a blessing, in the people of God and with the real father. That's real. And then keep praying for the, real, for the other father. I'm not sure if I mentioned the question. There you go. Thank you. Thank you for your insight. We'll keep moving here. I'm going to ask a question to uh, Tim. How can we combat the tendency to get it over with quickly when helping a person to recover? I find that the shame factor makes us want to shortcut the process of involvement before a person is truly equipped to go it alone. Maybe there's not a question there, but do you have a comment about that? Yeah, um, you, you can't find a quick solution to it. So just know that um, you have to be, if you want to help somebody else, you have to be willing to commit a lot of time and stick with that person for the long haul. Stick with that person for the long haul. Thank you. Thank you, Tim. I'm my. I have a lot, a lot of questions here that I'm not sure how to sift through. So I think what I think what we're going to do is I'm just going to say thank you to um, everyone that has that has pitched in and send in questions. Thank you to the panelists. We're gonna we're gonna wrap this time up and transition here. So if the moderator could could get ready to come on up. Um, I, I hope that that uh, just in, in in closing, I think of the the man that went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves. So when you meet these people that we we've, we've been talking about specific areas, when you meet these people that have fell among thieves, will you be the one that will go and pour in the oil and pour in the wine? Will you be the one that'll put this person on your donkey? Will you be the one that helps this person and takes them to an inn and, uh, and helps them, showing them Christ's love, Christ's heart, Christ's compassion? If we could just inspire a little bit, of, a little bit more compassion and a little bit more action on your behalf, our mission is complete. God bless you. You can have one second. Can you hear me? Hey, by me saying no, it sounds like I'm cold and impersonal person. For the nine years, we've had a soup kitchen in Chambersburg that we feed people. And we're very active in the street. It's just, I even go and feed junkies in Philadelphia. But when it comes to cash, I'm very hesitant. Thank you. You can be dismissed. Hand it over to the moderator. Thank you, brothers. 
Thank you very much. That was very, very rich. Much food for thought. Some prospect for future blessing to our people. I think uh, could well come out of this panel discussion. I'm, I'm very thankful for that which we have been privileged to participate in, listen in, and actually participate in tonight.